Hi, my name is Ruma. And my name is Yasmin. And we're here to tell you how we can all do something about the climate crisis. Because it's not too late. Stay tuned to the end to find out how you can make a difference. You might be thinking, oh no, another video about global warming and climate change emergency. We're going to hear about how everything is terrible and things should have been done ages ago and now it's too late and we're too small to make a difference and we can't recycle our way out of the problem. This isn't that kind of video. Yes, we will talk about how things are at the moment and I can't lie, they aren't great. But we can make it better. We have the skills, we have the resources and we will have the technology. Really, we just have to focus, get together, stop procrastinating and focus on what we can change rather than what we can't. So if you take away one thing from this video, let it be this. Change is possible. But before we can get into how we can change things, a quick catch up on where we're at. Most scientists pinpoint the start of our present climate emergency to the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. But because the weather changes every year, we didn't realise something was wrong until the 1950s. And it would take humanity another 30 years to realise that it might have to do with our actions. There were even companies and lobbies who actively seek to delay and deny scientific research in the area, most famously Exxon, who knew from at least 1977 that the burning of fossil fuels was causing global warming. However, way before global warming was a thing, environmental practices have been around. Soil conservation dates back at least 2,000 years, and we know that in the 14th and 16th centuries, some people were starting to link pollution to disease, and many indigenous people were connected to the environment, from which they depended socially, spiritually, and materially. The 60s and 70s saw a real flourishing of environmental groups as we currently know them. Things like the Chipko movement in India, which linked forest protection with women's rights and became a rallying point for global environmentalists. In 1992, at the Rio Earth Summit, the UN stepped in. This would be the first time the majority of the world's countries signed a UN Framework Convention, where they promised to avoid dangerous climate change. The Kyoto Protocol, in 1997, set targets on emission cuts for each developed country and aimed for a 5% cut in overall global greenhouse gases by 2012. But right from the start, there were a lot of problems with this. So with everyone dragging their feet, the protocol only came into force in 2005, but by then it was largely irrelevant. In December 2015, the Paris Agreement was signed by both developed and developing countries, where they committed to limiting greenhouse gas emissions in order to stay within temperature limits. The main goal of the Paris Agreement was to limit global heating to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, while pursuing efforts to stay within the lower, safer threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Despite some issues, most infamously the US withdrew from the agreement under President Trump, this deal, combined with the renewed interest in climate activism, has stirred countries and individuals to do something about the crisis. The way we talk about climate change has been revolutionised in the last five years, and increasingly more individuals, with children making up the majority, have risen to the challenge to save our planet. But why? Why does it matter that the world is getting a bit warmer every year? Isn't that kind of nice? And isn't it normal too? After all, there have been many climate fluctuations throughout the ages. I mean, it is true that the climate has changed throughout humanity's history, and way before we have arrived to the scene. But changes are speeding up and becoming more extreme. The temperatures aren't dropping. Most of this extra global heat is not going to some sunny days at the park, but to the ocean. And by most, we mean 93% of it. We all grew up with images of lone polar bears in melting icebergs. And it's true, we're destroying the habitat of thousands of animals. But all that melting ice is also causing the sea to rise in dangerous levels. As wildlife habitats are destroyed, animals are forced into greater contact with humans. It's no accident that new zoonotic diseases are on the rise. Rising sea levels also mean many places will be submerged forever, and it has already started, like in the Solomon Islands. A warmer ocean also has great influence on weather patterns. 
Extreme weather events, like hurricanes, are becoming stronger every year, and many parts of the world are already suffering with anomalous and unpredictable increases in floods, droughts, heat waves, and wildfires. Since 2000, flooding accounts for 43% of all extreme weather events. We've seen the videos of the flooding in London early this year and the devastation that torrential rain caused in Germany. But imagine how much worse it can get when you don't have support infrastructures around you to deal with the consequences of flooding. The impact of floods and other extreme weather events like cyclones can last long after waters recede. For example, schools may remain closed as they might not be the means to make them suitable for classes anymore, not to mention the quick rise of casualties and waterborne diseases in affected areas. If excess water is a problem, the lack of it is another. Under the Paris Agreement pledges, children born in 2020 will face 2.6 times more droughts on average than children born in 1960. And for many families reliant on the land, drought means that they will be unable to afford a nutritious diet, keep their children in school, or pay for healthcare. Are you starting to see a pattern? Again and again, children, and particularly children of low and middle income countries, are the ones that will suffer the most because of the climate crisis. And this is despite them holding the least responsibility for it with the top 50% of states being responsible for 86% of global CO2. It doesn't make sense, does it? Climate and environmental threats are responsible for disruptions in the education of over 37 million children each year. Presently, 16 million children in East and Southern Africa are at emergency levels of food insecurity, or worse. And of course, in places under political instability or full-blown conflict, the climate emergency just makes everything much worse. Extreme weather events have caused more than twice as many new displacements in 2020 as conflict and violence. The numbers are so big that a new term has been created. Climate refugees. The climate emergency isn't great for gender equality either. Four out of five people displaced by climate change are female and the climate is amplifying pre-existing gender inequalities and discrimination experienced by girls. Girls in vulnerable households are more likely to leave school and get married in times of weather-related crisis. And many girls face gender-specific threats and violence in response to their climate and environmental advocacy, which is seen as challenging gender norms. So it's all looking very grim, but this is only half the picture. Positive change is already underway. For example, in the creation of programs that embrace a greener, more sustainable approach to humanitarian aid. They are created and developed to help local communities make the best out of their capabilities and assets, now and in the future. Like in Malawi, where communities are given nutrition and farming lessons to make sure they create a local, sustainable economy. Or in Bangladesh, the Suchana program, which has a strong component on gender equality too. When communities are empowered locally and are given the means to create value by themselves, when something like an extreme weather event happens, they'll be more likely to recover without the need of external assistance. And they'll also be less likely to engage in problematic coping strategies like child labor or child marriage. The other side of what's happening is the incredible surge of child activism in relation to climate, spurred by figures like Greta Thunberg in Sweden, Shia Bastida in Mexico, Lysian Matunke in Kenya, Leah Namugurwa in Uganda, and many, many others. This all means that, despite everything, we are trying to go in the right direction. And we, younger generations, will be crucial to stir the rest of the world to complete the vital task of saving our planet. Antonio Guterres said the climate emergency is a race that we are losing, but it is a race that we can win. We can't let the numbers and statistics get us down. We need to learn to look at science and data as a starting point for change and start sprinting. Firstly, we need to make children an essential part of the solution. That will mean having climate education as part of the global curriculums, as well as pressuring governments to invest in and promote green skills. 
Climate education should also open the door to have children and young people at the main table when decisions that will affect our future are being taken. Secondly, we need to make sure our governments are pushing to limit warming to 1.5 Celsius. This means prioritising climate finance on their national budgets. Without a substantial increase in financing, climate commitments and policies will remain empty promises to the millions of children affected by the climate crisis on a daily basis. Things like making green energy accessible to all and subsidising the re-education and acquisition of new skills by people who work in the fossil and coal industries will need investment from both the public and private sectors. Making our economy green should not come at an individual cost. Developed countries need to meet their climate finance commitments, defined at the Copenhagen COP in 2009, to give developing countries at least $100 billion a year to help them cut greenhouse gas emissions and cope with the impacts of extreme weather. The number of people requiring humanitarian assistance will double by 2050, which makes things like sustainable livelihood programs and resilience structures essential. As a personal level, what can you do? Try to live as sustainably as possible within your means. But don't forget that not everyone is in a position to make certain choices. Electric cars are not affordable yet. Local food might be a bit more expensive. But we can all do our bit. A good place to start are the six R's. Rethink, refuse, repair, reduce, reuse and recycle. Meanwhile, get as much information about the climate crisis as you can. Ask your schools and teachers for information about the topic. Share it with your friends, family, anyone really. Tell them how important it is to make these lifestyle changes. And pressure our governments and industries to act now. Demand climate justice. Speaking as children who will inherit this earth, it is up to those currently in power to encourage society to repair the damages of our generation and previous generations. We challenge you to use the six R's and push the government to make a change before it is too late. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave us a like to let us know. All of our sources are in the description below. And if you want to see more of this kind of content, subscribe to our channel. Let us know in the comments what global causes you care about and want to see next. Bye. Bye. <laughs>